Coming up on Market to Market. The acreage report made the headlines, but the quarterly stocks report moved the markets. A blue ribbon panel of experts dives into the details next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sukup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sukup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it. This is the Friday, April 1 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. We're going to deviate from our regular format this week and spend the entire program focused on the details of USDA's prospective plantings and quarterly stocks reports. We've assembled a blue ribbon panel of experts to break down the numbers, but before we get started, let's set the table with this week's market closes. The news from USDA shook the grain markets, adding some volatility to the last two sessions. For the week, the May wheat contract rose 13 cents, while the nearby corn contract fell 16 cents. Soybeans declined on Thursday's news, but bounced back by the end of the week as the May contract gained 8 cents. May meal went against the flow, falling $3 per ton. In the softs, the May cotton contract added $1.48 per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, May Class 3 milk futures gained 26 cents. In the livestock sector, the June cattle contract fell $1.80, May feeders were off 33 cents, and the May lean hog contract declined $1.15. In the currency markets, a dovish comments from Fed Chair Janet Yellen helped push the U.S. dollar index 156 points lower this week. The May crude oil contract dropped 267 per barrel on news of continued oversupply. COMEX Gold held steady, and the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index lost 12.5 points to settle at 316.40. It is against that backdrop that we start our discussion. Here now to lend us their insight are four of our regular market analysts. Joining us are Tom Fitzenmeyer, the owner of Summit Commodity Brokerage and longtime analyst for Market to Market. Darren Newsom, DTN's senior market analyst, as well as the creator and guiding force behind DTN's six-factor marketing strategies. Ted Seifred, the chief market strategist for Zaner Ag Hedge Group and handles large and mid-size grain and livestock producers in the Americas. And with us also is Naomi Bloom, a market advisor for Stuart Peterson and co-creator of Stuart Peterson's program, Women to Women, Educating Women About Farm Marketing. Welcome, everyone. We had a busy Thursday Mm -hmm. in the grain trade. We had the quarterly stocks report, USDA's prospective plantings report, taken together as a group. I want to start with you, Tom. Give me your two or three sentence thought on those reports. How are they going to affect us long term in the grain trade? Well, I mean, the, the biggest number that stands out was the, was the huge increase in planted acres and corn. You know, co- farmers all, all winter long have been told that corn's probably more profitable than beans, and obviously they responded, near, farmers in nearly every state in the country increased acreage. So I, I think that was, that was the big one, and that, you know, spills over into beans and everything else. So I guess that would be my biggest takeaway of the Thursday reports. All right, Ted, anything else jump out at you on this report? Yeah, grain stocks were pretty much along the lines of expectations. Um, you are, we're one of the firms that puts out our expectations for the grain reports. We were the closest number on corn and wheat. Soybeans, we were 30 million bushels off of. So that was very much along the lines of what we were looking for in changes in demand. As far as the acreage number, it's a big number, took the market by surprise. But I think we have to take it with a little bit of grain of salt because there's been a fair amount of things that have changed since those surveys took place. Interesting point. We'll come back to that in a little bit. Now, Naomi Bloom, how did you respond to Thursday's reports? Well, it was pretty much in line with what we were thinking. Of course, the corn number, a little bit more of a surprise. I do think that the wheat number that came out was really friendly to the market, and I think that's going to help create a longer-term bottom for wheat because of just the 
five million acre reduction from last year. So we still, of course, have huge wheat supplies globally, but I think the story is finally changing for the wheat market. Okay. Now, Darren Newsom, not always the biggest supporter or believer in USDA's reports. <laughs> what was your takeaway on Thursday? Well, my takeaway is that we couldn't choose a better day to talk about the importance of USDA reports than today. Um, my takeaway, as far as the key point, is if you use corn's quarterly stocks number of 7.8 or whatever it was, and the way it reflects on first half demand, and you figure out, you kind of project forward on normal second half demand, and find out that we're being, that USDA right now is overstating total demand, that's going to pull ending stocks over 2 billion bushels. Then you throw the 96.3 or 93.6, that would really be alarming if it was 96.3, but 93.6 million acres on it, and you're looking north of 2.5, 2.6 billion bushels for next year's ending stocks. Yes, 15.3 million billion bushel corn, corn crop at trend line yields. Yeah, and, that, and that's a huge question in and of itself. Now, I want to have the time to talk about the rest of the markets. We've alluded to wheat a little bit. Darren, I want your thoughts here on this wheat market. From a technical perspective, where do we sit here in the wheat trade? Well, technically, wheat turned bullish a while back uh, for no reason whatsoever. I mean, we've, there's more wheat in the world. I mean, what, global ending stocks use 33, 34 percent, domestic ending stocks just under 50 percent, yeah, global ending stocks use, uh, it's, it's ridiculous numbers. We found out we can't kill it. We know that. And you know, we tried to kill it again before Easter, right around Easter time. Uh, freeze all the way through the Southern Plains. Wheat looks fine. Talk to everybody down there. So really the only thing it's got going for it right now, it has no demand, can't kill it. It's gonna be a technical move. And those probably won't last against, uh, you know, just overwhelm overwhelmingly bearish fundamentals. At some point that's gonna kick back in. Okay. Now, Naomi, you had mentioned that the numbers on this report, the 5 million drop in total wheat acres, uh, could help us establish a longer term bottom here in the wheat trade. How long term are you looking? Well, I would say that Darren brings up a lot of good points from the standpoint that the global ending stocks are still very large and that's going to be the more of the dominating factor for the market right now. But the fact that now the perception is sh shifting that there's going to be just a little bit less supplies in the United States. Now, what if other nations um, around the world start to follow suit and just do just those little tidbits of less production? It's putting the brakes on the negativity. And so from that standpoint, I would think if you take it maybe a year or year and a half out, we start to see maybe a longer term rounding bottom on the charts. Um, nothing that's going to make the market just rally from here. But I think the negative is in. Okay. Now, Ted, with these massive global stocks of wheat, mm -hmm. how much spillover weakness could we expect as more and more of this wheat gets diverted for feed usage, not just domestically, but worldwide? Right, yeah, so you worry about corn losing out uh, to wheat uh, on feed usage there. But, you know, to, to talk on their two points, um, while we're not going to go into a bullish wheat market, fundamentally speaking, anytime soon, both domestically and globally, uh, you do get the feeling that maybe the worst of the news is behind us now that we're cutting acres pretty aggressively. And from a technical perspective, when we get that worst of the bearish fundamental news out of the way, then you've got some pressure relief there. You've got your sellers that are, are now slowing down and then some profit taking, a little, bit of, a little bit of a bounce. And I'm not sure what that next big bearish story is going to be for the wheat that's going to push us down to new lows. So if wheat at some point ever can find some help from the row crops, Maybe we do have a little bit of upside potential with the lower acreage number, uh, but those global stocks do kind of put a ceiling there. Okay. Now, Tom, Ted just mentioned if we can find the bear story. And throughout this past year, you have been a little more bearish on a lot of the grain stocks than some other analysts. Can you find a bear story in this wheat market beyond just the well, massive? Except for the acres, what else is there? When we got tons of, like Darren said, we got tons of wheat around the world, <laughs> and then and then you got to factor in the fact that the, the Chinese have said that they're going to, they want to cut down their corn reserves. They're going to stop importing feed, feed grains, which which throws what 30 million metric ton out on the world market that somehow has to be absorbed someplace. So I I, I don't know. I, I agree we can probably have some kind of a little short covering technical rally that takes us up some, but you don't want to get yourself all whooped up about that, that it's going very far. Because where do we sit in the wheat market as far as spec trade? Are they still short, heavily short that market? Oh, yeah, okay. absolutely. 
Okay. Absolutely. So there, there. That's where the opportunity for a short covering we rally. Were, we were we were record a few weeks ago. Now yes. I think we've we've come back off that record by just a bit, but we're still at near it. You know. Okay. So. And what they did in the bean market over the last right. few weeks kind of demonstrates what can happen if they decide they want to do that. Seventy cent rally. Yes. yes. Yeah. Going yes. from short to long. Right. And they weren't record short beans at the time. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you do that on either corn or wheat, you give them a reason to do it, then you've got yourself a nice little rally there. And how aggressive do we need to be making sales on that kind of a rally? Now, which commodity are we talking about? Wheat, still in the wheat market. Still if we wheat, put we can't. 50 cents on it. You can't sell wheat. It's, I mean, how, how do you forward contract to wheat when you don't know if you're gonna have five bushels the acre or 50 bushels the acre? Right. I mean, that's what we've run up against forever. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of folks out there say, oh yeah, forward contract, be 30, 40, 50%. That's fine, then you wrote and then you raise 15%. You can lock in. Uh, you, floor puts. You, you, you can do puts and these sorts of things, but as far as going out and forward contracting, uh, you really can't do it. Okay. Uh, you know, those folks in Southern Plains who thought maybe their wheat was taken to zero, they might have lifted all their hedges, and now they're sitting in you know, a very similar situation to what we saw in 97, uh, at a situation where wheat looks like it's going to be fine. Okay. It's not corn. I mean, it's not corn, and it's certainly not soybeans. Right. So. A lot less predictable. Yeah. All right. Well, now, speaking of corn, that was the big shock on USDA's prospective plantings report, 93 and a half million acres, well above the oh market boy. expectation of 89 and change million acres. Yeah. Uh, Ted, let's start with you here on this corn market. What does that mean for new crop grain? How aggressive do we need to be getting sales on the books with that kind of a planting intention ahead of us? Let's talk about the planting intentions number, uh, 96.3. These surveys were done at the beginning of the month, and a lot has changed since the beginning of the month. <clears throat> For one, look at the Delta. They have gotten hit with rain after rain after rain. Uh, I've been talking to guys down there that have planted corn that is now flooded out, and they're wondering if they're going to get a chance to replant it or not. For the acres that haven't been planted, there's a big question mark on whether that goes in or not. There's 2.3 million acres, according to intentions, to be going in in Louisiana, Mississippi, and Arkansas. Of that 2.3 million, you could lose a fair amount of that. Now, I don't think you're going to lose all of it, certainly not, uh, but you could lose somewhere between 500,000 and a million. So right there, you can start whittling, whittling away at that, that 93.6 number. Aside from that, you've seen soybeans rally almost 70 cents since the beginning of this month, or I'm sorry, the beginning of last month. And then in the meantime, you've had corn down, mostly coming from that report. Mm -hmm. So that 75 plus cent gain that, bean, that beans have had over corn in that time frame since these surveys were taken could be swaying some last minute acres as well. So maybe we're talking a corn acre closer to about a 92 million rather than a 93.6. Uh, 93 uh, and if that's the case, we still have a fairly big cushion for a weather issue this year maybe not as big as what the market was just trying to digest. Okay, and now that leads us right into one of our questions here from a Twitter follower that, Ted, I think you led right into it. Darren, I'd like to get your follow-up. Glenn in Bryan, Ohio, is wondering what is the shelf life of a USDA plantings report when exposed to weather influences in April? <laughs> you know, right now it's the only number we have. These numbers are gonna change. Um, it trumps weather at this point, because if you're going to plant 93.6 million acres of corn, there isn't going to be a weather event. At least there's not forecast to be a weather event to the magnitude of the magnitude to affect that crop. So you're still going to be looking at way too much production at a time when we can't move anything. So, um, you know, can Mother Nature play a role in it? Sure. But I think Mother Nature's going to take a back seat to uh, Chairwoman Yellen this time around. It's going to take more from the Fed not moving on, on interest rates to push the dollar down to, to increase demand for the corn, more so than seeing any sort of crop uh, production problems. Okay. And now, Ted, I saw you. Yeah. You, we said silver. And I, I don't want to get super bullish here. Uh, and I'm not saying this is what we're going to mm -hmm. see. But we said the same thing in 2012 when we planted 97.3 million acres of corn. And we all saw what happened there. Now. I'm not saying we're going to have a 2012, but there are some weather concerns that we have, and even our weather guys who have been being very conservative about this growing season are now starting to see El Nino over the last two weeks capitulate a lot faster than what they had previously been expecting. So now they're thinking time frame of La Nina might actually affect this growing season. That talk has been around for a little while. So it's possible to have a weather event. I mean, when you look at acreage, we came in 3.6 above expectations, 5.6 above uh, of what we did last year. Basically, that's 5.6, a little less than 5.6 uh, 
bushels an acre when it comes to the yield. If you knock more than that off yield, then all of a sudden we do have a little bit of a tighter situation. Not tight necessarily, but a tighter or a shrinking balance sheet year over year. So it's more of a cushion, mm -hmm. but it's not a panacea for a weather issue if we were to have one. You bet, and there's a difference between a true weather event like we saw in 2012 versus a weather scare like we saw in last year's market right. with a great marketing but with opportunity. with funds being as short as they oh, are, yeah. you give them a little bit of a spark, and that can give us, now again, we're not talking 550 corn, but maybe we get to, there's a big technical target at 440 December corn. You give these funds a reason to cover, maybe you have a shot at that this growing season, be ready to sell it. All right, Naomi? I'm I, building on their arguments, I think that the most negative scenario has been priced in already and, and that the market is only going to continue per, to perceive that the acres aren't the 93.6 and that's a smaller amount. July corn futures hit that 350 target area this week and that was the downward channel line. I think that's going to be a big support area. And now get ready for another month of exciting, boring sideways markets because it's going to happen again because, you know, the market is always going to assume that the corn is going to get planted. And yeah, those delta acres may not be what we thought, but that's part of the reason that we'll find the short term bottom. We'll probably see corn, in my opinion, trade in a, about a 25 cent range for the next month, back and forth, more sideways trading until we get into additional weather issues down the road and like Darren was saying, the dollar and things like that. Okay, now Tom, we've been talking new crop corn. There's still a lot of farmers sitting with bins full of corn on the farm. After this week's break in corn prices, how do you handle that old crop corn market? They, they got put in a big bind this week, <laughs> yes. in my opinion. They, they've, been, they've been hearing this, El Nino is going to come and bail us out, and then we're not going to be able to plant the crop, and all this stuff all winter long. And so they're sitting, sitting, storing, storing, waiting, waiting, and now all of a sudden the tide's kind of turning on them. And, and I don't know, I, I think they're going to sit through the summer waiting for this this miraculous El Nino rally that's gonna, that's gonna bail them out. And I, I guess I'm not convinced that that's gonna be the case. Plus, I think you're gonna be fighting basis mm -hmm. as you go into the summer, as everybody else kind of comes to the same conclusion here. So, so do you take advantage the, of the basis the, as it is today and get some moved? Well, I, I, the, 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 Thursday was probably a little bit overdone, so you're probably going to get some little little tiny correction, and I'd certainly use that to, to start doing something. Okay. All right, well, now let's move into the soybean market. Uh, not a whole lot of big news there on either report as we looked at USDA's Thursday reports, but we're still being driven, it would seem like, from Brazil. Now, Darren, you talked about Janet Yellen's comments mm -hmm. affecting the dollar. What can we expect? Let's talk old crop soybeans first. Yeah, let's go back to old crop, and we're gonna, I'm going to just revise one thing here. You know, quarterly stocks got completely ignored uh, for soybeans, and... Yeah, it was a big number, 1.5 something billion bushels, and, and and that's what everybody focused on. But what you know, most of them ignored, and what always gets ignored in soybeans is that what it shows is that first half demand was actually much stronger than usual, much stronger than normal. And again, it looks like USDA is over, is underestimating demand if we see just average numbers uh, over the second half of the marketing year. That means we could pull another 100 million bushel uh, off of ending stocks by the time we get to the September 30th quarterly, quarterly numbers. Is that a big deal when we're talking about 460? No, it's not. But if we're having trouble in South America and we have all these uh, you know political uprisings and so on and the real is starting to go up, um, dollar starts to come down. We may even ship better. We may, we, we may even look better over the second half than what we normally do. All of a sudden, we're starting to whittle back our ending stocks numbers again. And so, you know, I always find it interesting that no one's ever really called to the carpet for how they can be so off all the time on soybean demand and soybean ending stocks numbers. And it certainly looks like, you know, at least it's going to be fun to watch it happen again over the second half of this marketing year. Okay. What's your explanation for political upheaval being friendly to the real. Yeah, that's, that's a great question, Tom. Uh, I guess it's just because the system they have right now is so corrupt, there's been no, uh, there, there's no interest in the real at all. And right. ideas that they're going to do something different, anything different would be better than what they have and it's going to put more confidence in their currency. And that's, that's similar to what I've been reading. They're, they're hopeful that a, a more pro-business yep. uh, South American leader could step in if Dilma Rousseff mm -hmm. were to 
be impeached or resigned. There's a lot of embedded corruption there yeah, because that's you think be about rooted it. out, and I don't know how that gets done by anybody. You right. overthrow an entire government that's norm normally not bullish for a currency. I right. Think. No. Yes. <laughs> but also internally, I think that there is less expenditures going on there because guys are kind of waiting to see what happens. So with that money multiplier, money flow slowing down, that's also sort of bullish for the currency as well. Okay. So now, how aggressive, Naomi? Do guys need to be producers? Need to be on making new crop sales on this rally we've got in the bean market. We're over the 20, over the 200 day moving average. Are you aggressive pulling the trigger on new sales? I think you better get started on something because the 75 cent rally just doesn't come around every day, especially for how quiet it had been for months. So it's important to get started. It's prudent to get started. Um, and then from here, we probably see the market set back a little bit because it had been so overbought, but just the setback is more of a, a healthy correction where it'll wait and see and, and try to get a feel for it. And if any acres were switched to beans, how many that would be. Um, and then we wait for summer weather. But I would absolutely be making sales on this rally. Okay. Now we will continue discussing the USDA reports on our Market Plus segment, which can be found on our website at iptv.org slash M2M. But right now, I want to take a turn in the last couple minutes of the program and talk about the livestock markets. Had a great day in feeder cattle on Thursday. As yeah. corn dropped 16 cents, <laughs> yep. feeder cattle went limit up. Tom, where do we go from here? Maybe up to 160 on the feeder market. I, I, I think you'll have, be, have a hard time going beyond that. I'm, livestock producers, or particular cattle producers, seem to have a little trouble understanding that we're in a major downtrend in cattle that's going to go on for a while. Right. And when you're in a major downtrend, you have to use all these little rallies up as selling opportunities. Probably, you know, 136 maybe, or I mean 130, excuse me, on the, on the June contract and on the fat market. I just this is going to create, like Naomi said on the beans, a little opportunity in the yeah. feeder cattle. Okay, Ted? Yeah. yeah, I tend to agree with that. I mean, cattle as a whole, we got excited about grilling season starting early and demand coming in. We saw some good export sales, and we kind of ran away with it. But in the meantime, we saw placements go 110% of what we had last year. This week, we have weights 25 pounds over what we were last year. Supply is growing, and it's outgrowing demand. So the longer-term trend is most likely down use the balances to make some sales. Okay, Darren, I saw you really looking like you had something to say. <laughs> well, I'm gonna respectfully disagree here. Uh, if mm -hmm. I look at my long-term charts and throw out all fundamentals, which I love to do and don't even look at them, um, we're still in a long-term uptrend for what I see on both live cattle and feeder cattle, that we put our lows in, bounced up, so you know, if you do classic wave theory or whatever you wanna look at, all we did was really uh, finish off the first move. So now we've come back down, we've got the June cattle uh, moving back down towards the, the old low of near 122, sitting around 132 right now. Find, you know, we'll see if it starts to find some support. Similar situation in feeder cattle. So I would say just purely, and it's like every other market, crude oil and some of these others that have no fundamental reason to look bullish. Uh, I would say that the long-term monthly charts for live cattle and feeder cattle, I guess have looked at screwy enough, they still look bullish. Okay. So you think the 10-year high is still to come? Well, no. Now, I will say that we, we put in the high. Now, the next long-term uptrend is probably not going to take out that high. So that if you took, to put the 10-year high in, mm -hmm. and you think you put the 10-year low in, then six months later? I mean, that well, seems no, highly unlikely well, to me. What I'm saying is, short 10 years. What I'm saying is we saw, the, we saw the classic finish off of a trend here in what? January, well, maybe last December. Yep. December and then we, then we bounced 14, back up 14. here early, like what, February or something, and then we've pulled back a little bit. So we, we are not going to go up to a new 10 year high, but we could for the next two, three years, you know, stay within this range from where we've been uh, to the high from where we just set our low. And ultimately, could we go lower? Absolutely. Okay. Now but Naomi, that will be the beginning of the next trend. Yeah. Let so. me let me help build his case fundamentally. <laughs> um, so yes, you guys are right from the standpoint that the U.S. herd is is rebuilding without <laughs> question. It's happening, but um, over in Australia, their their herd is is being reduced a little bit, and with our dollar dropping, our exports have really been good. They have really yeah. been good, and they're expected to continue. And now finally, we can have some more market share because of the less supply in other places. So I'm of the opinion, you know, we had that nice little rally higher here recently and now a setback and I think we're going to see more of a sideways trading range. I don't think we fall apart totally yet, but we also are at this really big crux where we have to have a, a really good supply and demand battle right now and, and it's going to take a couple months to 
All right. Finish so it how, out. How are cattle going to compete with por uh, right. huge pork supplies at lower prices, lower huge prices. poultry supplies at lower prices? Because it tastes you... good. <laughs> well, it does. And that's, <laughs> it does. That's, that's been a factor in yeah. this market. Now, yes. Tom, you mentioned pork. We have seen an incredible rally in this pork market over the past six months. Does it look like it's getting a little toppy to you? We've been trading here sideways for the past week. Where does this pork market go in the short term? Uh, again, I think you get up in that 82 level. You probably, and, and if you're a pork producer, you probably need to make s sales for those summer contracts. Okay. All right, get aggressive and yeah. get some on the books. Now, Naomi, on um, the hawk market? Um, I, I think that the hawk market is, is near a, a short-term high here. Um, it's having, it got through that resistance level, but it just didn't have the, the momentum behind it. Uh, the hog producers are doing a great job about not expanding the herd, and we've seen that in the breeding numbers, um, and, and the weights are pretty current and consistent. So I think the hog market um, is going to, they're doing a great job of, of managing, um, and, and the demand is just constant. That market needs to see exports pick up yeah. um, in order to uh, deal with the potential supplies that are coming down the road, uh, and, and I would agree this is an opportunity for sales. All right, now that time just flew by. Yeah, well, and we will talk crude oil, we'll talk dairy, we'll talk cotton in the Market Plus segment you can find on our website. And with that, I want to say thank you guys so much for taking the time to come and share your insight with us this week. Thanks for having us. Yes. Yeah. That wraps up the broadcast portion of Market to Market, but we are going to keep the conversation going and answer more of your questions during Market Plus, which is available on our website. While you're there, check out our In the News section to see other stories of importance to rural America. And join us again next week when we'll examine how winemakers are using Mother Nature's killing frost to squeeze a little more juice out of the fruit of the vine. So until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it.